Good afternoon. Today is October 26th, Tuesday afternoon, Rabbi Ike's movie class, and we're going to be talking about Crossing the Lancy. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's really nice to, to see you all. And uh, welcome back to another uh, series on uh, real Jewish classics. Um, and thanks to those who came out uh, last Tuesday night to hear about Cabaret, too. We had a pretty good turnout on that Tuesday evening, so we're going to look for something in the month of November and perhaps something in the month of December just to do <clears> some, <throat> some more one-offs with movies in the evenings. So keep an eye out for that as well. So, But, but one of the things I've really enjoyed about doing this class all the way along is uh, pairing movies, right? Uh, showing uh, two movies kind of in parallel to each other. So we're continuing to organize this class that way. So this week we're watching Crossing Delancey and next week we'll watch Hester Street. So and the, these movies have a few things in common. Uh, um, not the least of them, I suppose, is that they're both named after streets on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. So when I take the confirmation class to New York and we do our walking tour of the Lower East Side, we do indeed cross Delancey. Um, I have to say that doesn't mean anything to them, but having seen this movie uh, since... Uh, it came out in 1988. You know, every time I cross the Lancy, I think of this movie, right? Uh, and certainly every time I walk on Hester Street, I think of that movie. So, um, and and we hit both of those places on our walking tour of the Lower East Side. So, um, uh, uh, there. But these movies have some other things in common, and most importantly, I want to talk about the director because uh, we're seeing two movies directed by a woman director, Joan Micklin Silver, who um, is a, a real pioneer in, in terms of women in the movies. Um, you know, she, um, uh, she's one of the ones, uh, you know, to break that, start putting cracks at least in that glass ceiling, which uh, we're seeing more and more today, you know, uh, um, the opportunity for women to direct uh, direct movies. It was very rare. Uh, certainly back in 1975 when she directed Hester Street, uh, which was an independent movie. We'll talk more about uh, probably even its financing last week, uh, next week rather. Um, but, um, you know, by the time of Crossing Delancey, she actually was working within the studio system. And so it's a big deal that she had the opportunity through a studio, United Artists, uh, to make this movie. I should point out that United Artists is also the company that financed Woody Allen movies back in those days. And um, so if you wonder, how does a movie like this even get made, right? You know, it's uh, uh, it seems a little bit niche, uh, you know, in that sense, right? Who wants to watch a movie about Jews on the Lower East Side of New York? and uh, upper Upper West Side, I guess. Um, uh, well, the same people who watch, you know, Woody Allen movies, Annie Hall, Manhattan, Hannah and Her Sisters, right? Those movies, which uh, uh, so the so the same company that uh, put up the money for those, put up the money for this. Uh, I'm sure they. Uh, I think the total budget um, was four hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and the movie made several million dollars. So it was actually a good uh, return on their investment, um, even though it is, uh, a, you know, no one expected it to be Star Wars, right? Um, and, you know, it's, uh, but, but still the, there was expectation that it would return on the investment and it did. Uh, but I just to say a couple of words about Joan Micklin Silver, I mean, she uh, born in Omaha, Nebraska in 1935 into a Jewish family. Her, um, her father built a company called Micklin Lumber in uh, Omaha, and um, she married the son of a rabbi. Actually, uh, you may have heard of the rabbi Abba Hillel Silver. Um, so she married Abba Hillel Silver's son, who uh, uh, Rabbi Silver was uh, uh, a rabbi of uh, a congregation in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and um, so she married uh, that, that son, and she attended Sarah Lawrence College, she graduated Sarah Lawrence in 1956, uh, and lived with her husband in Cleveland 
for the next decade or so after that, raising uh, their three daughters. And in 1967, when um, uh, her husband was actually uh, um, retiring, I think already at that point, uh, they moved to New York. And she um, uh, had been writing all along, but uh, she's hired by uh, Otto Preminger to write a script, uh, an adaptation of a book called Such Good Friends. Now, it turns out that, that he didn't use that script and in fact turned to other script writers to, to create uh, the screenplay for him. But, um, but that's her start in the movie business. And she ends up writing a couple of other movies and then um, writes and directs a short film called The Immigrant Experience, The Long, Long Journey in 1972. And that becomes uh, uh, sort of the, the, the thing that gives her both the, the, the bug to do direct movies and also is sort of her calling card to try and get the opportunity to direct movies. Um, Hester Street is her first full length movie. We'll talk about that in detail next week. But um, um, in between Hester Street and this movie, she made a couple of other movies. Um, she made another uh, independent movie called Between the Lines, which uh, is actually also an interesting film uh, set at a, uh, uh, a small newspaper, something like The Village Voice, although it's uh, set in Boston. And um, as, as with, with uh, many of her movies, the cast is remarkable. Um, uh, um, before anyone had ever heard of him, uh, Jeff Goldblum, is one of the stars of that movie, Between the Lines. John Hurd is in that movie. There's a lot of people um, uh, who become very well known later. Um, her first studio movie is a movie called uh, Chilly Scenes of Winter, based on an Ann Beatty novel that came out in 1979, so four years after Hester Street. And, um, and then in between that and this movie, she made a movie that I think it got a theatrical release, but it was made for television originally called Finnegan Begin Again uh, with Robert Preston and Mary Tyler Moore. And, um, and then uh, th her next movie would have been this one. Uh, she made several movies for TV towards the end of her career. Um, she made a couple more studio movies. Uh, one you may have heard of, uh, Patrick Dempsey, long before Grey's Anatomy in a movie called uh, Lover Boy. Right. So, um, so, so she really did, uh, um, you know, she's, she's really a part of the first wave of women directors. I mean, you, you don't see a lot of other names in that time period, uh, in, in the seventies and eighties. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, to tell you the truth, I can't think of one in the seventies and eighties besides her. Um, there, there probably are, but I, I can't think of one. Um, maybe some of the European directors, you know, were coming along uh, ready, right? Um, and folks like Agnes Varda and um, um, the Jane Campion and things like that maybe got their start during that time period, but not in America, you know, not, not in Hollywood. Uh, back in the 50s, there were a couple of women who directed movies, a couple of actresses who got the opportunity, Ida Lupino directed a couple of movies in, in the 1950s that are actually pretty well regarded in retrospect. But Joan Micklin Silver is, is somebody special, a name we should know. So, um, so she directed this, and as I said, she directed uh, the next one that we'll see, and we'll be able to compare and contrast a little bit uh, uh, these two movies. I uh, should also mention the, the screenwriter of uh, Crossing Delancey. It's a woman named Susan Sandler. And uh, she is currently a professor at the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU in New York City. She teaches screenwriting. Um, uh, she's, uh, you know, she doesn't have as many credits on her resume, I'd say, as, uh, uh, as Joan Micklin Silver does, but she has written some other um, uh, plays and movies over the years. Make sure you get the right one there. Yeah, that's her uh, on the right. Um, there is a, a, a woman by the same name who's a philanthropist from California. So, but uh, that, that's her. Um, so uh, uh, 
she wrote a TV movie called Friends at Last with Kathleen Turner in it. Uh, she she wrote a movie I, that I have not seen, which uh, is sort of intriguing. I'm going to try and see if it's available. The Florence Greenberg story uh, it starred, uh, starred Bette Midler. Uh, I know nothing about it. So most recently, she produced and, uh, and directed a documentary um, that also looks interesting and is available on Amazon Prime called Julia Scotty, Funny That Way. It's a documentary about a trans uh, trans comedian uh, performed as a man back in, in the 70s and then uh, uh, came out as trans and is now sort of rebuilding a comedy career. So, um, so it looks like an interesting thing. So, um, but anyways, uh, she wrote the original play that uh, the movie Crossing Delancey is based on and then wrote the screenplay for Joan Micklin Silver as well. And uh, just to talk a little bit about some of the cast members and in, uh, when we talk about how does a movie like this get uh, financed, uh, the fact that Amy Irving was attached to it early probably made a difference. This was um, a few years after Amy Irving's um, uh, Oscar nomination for her performance in Yentl. Um, Amy Irving, of course, is uh, from a Jewish family and um, uh, at the time that this movie was made, yeah, there's a picture of her with her husband at the time, uh, Steven Spielberg. So, um, so the combination of uh, her having had an Oscar nomination in her past, the connection to Spielberg doesn't hurt, um, though uh, I don't think he had anything to do with financing for this film. I, uh, I looked uh, it up. He did. He did? Yep. I, okay. I, I, I'll try to find the exact same thing, but... You know, yeah. Okay. I mean, it doesn't really surprise me, but I, I didn't yeah. know that, you know? So, um, but so like I said, it was not an expensive movie to make. Um, so uh, uh, United Artists, uh, but certainly uh, if nothing else, you know, United Artists would be interested in financing a movie with Steven Spielberg's wife because they'd like to produce some things that Steven Spielberg was making, right? So, uh, so those connections don't hurt, right? That's, that's the kind of uh, uh, world that Hollywood works in, right? Uh, one hand washes another. So, um, um, so, um, so that, that's uh, Amy Irving. And I, I do think her attachment to this project uh, helped get it made. Uh, Peter Riegert was was well known already at this point. I mean, it's maybe not a big star. Uh, he got kind of his big break in Animal House ten years earlier, in 1978. Um, he uh, also born in New York City uh, in the Bronx in a Jewish household. So um, so you know, playing a Jewish character though he didn't often didn't always play Jewish characters on screen. Um, he does have a small part in um, Joan Micklin Silver's earlier movie, Chilly Scenes of Winter. So uh, she knew him already. And, um, and he was building a pretty nice career for himself, which, which continues to the present day. I mean, he uh, um, still appears regularly, mostly on television. I mean, he had a recurring role in The Sopranos uh, a number of years ago. He played an assemblyman. Uh, more recently, if anyone's seen the TV series, the uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, uh, which uh, may come up a couple of times in our uh, conversation. Um, uh, he had a recurring role in that as well, um, as does Carol Kane, who uh, uh, we'll talk about next week when we talk about Hester Street. So, um, but so he's continued to appear on a lot of things. He actually was in the, uh, uh, the finale of Seinfeld, um, he, he was uh, in a TV series, a, a mini series called Ellis Island, where he plays a Jewish character, a Jewish immigrant, Jacob Rubenstein. Um, he actually, uh, one of his first appearances on TV was in the TV series MASH, where he has a few appearances as Corporal Igor Stramansky. Um, so um, he appears there a few times. So um, so, and so you have the, the two, uh, the actor and the actress in this movie are, are both of Jewish descent uh, playing Jews in the movie. 
And of course, Razel Bosick, uh, the Bubby in this movie, uh, you know, Amy Irving's grandmother. Film. Uh, she lived from 1914 to 1993. And um, she was born in Poland and died in New York City. She was married to uh, an actor, and, and the two of them were both in the Yiddish theater um, in the 1930s. Um, really, she was in the, in the Yiddish theater until she died. Yeah, so there's a picture of her and her husband, uh, Razel and Max Bozik. They got married in 1935. Uh, by 1939, they were, um, uh, they had two kids. Um, and in 1939, when Poland was invaded by the Nazis, as it happened, the Bozics and their infant daughter were in Argentina performing Yiddish theater in Argentina. Um, you know, we don't really uh, uh, think so much about uh, that, that old Yiddish theater scene, but the truth is that the Yiddish plays were performed all the time in Poland and in New York in particular but also in places like Buenos Aires. I mean, it was kind of a circuit. Uh, and so they happened to be in Argentina um, with their, their baby daughter, their, their four-year-old four was uh, in Poland. Um, and so the family became separated. They stayed here and unfortunately their son died um, in Europe. Um, so Razel Bozik herself was, was uh, uh, they say she was born on stage. Uh, her mother was, was pregnant with her, uh, her, her mother was a performer and, uh, and, you know, was performing in a Yiddish play when she was born. From the time she could walk, she was in the U Yiddish theater. So, um, um, you know, th this is one of the few, uh, few things that you'll find Razel Bozik in speaking English. Actually, so uh, she did appear in some Yiddish movies in the 1930s. Um, she continued to appear in Yiddish theater. Um, you know, there, there was a Yiddish uh, American vaudeville on Miami Beach when I was growing up. And, and people like Molly Pecan and Razel Bozik were the big names, big name stars that came in and performed at the Yiddish theater. So, um, so, uh, and uh, perhaps a little more surprisingly to Sylvia Miles, uh, a well-known actress, her real name was Sylvia Scheinwald. So she is not a stranger to, uh, to Jewish characters either. Uh, in fact, her first uh, movie was Murder Incorporated in 1960, which is actually about uh, Jewish gangsters. Uh, uh, it doesn't play up their Jewishness very much, but... Um, you know, the, the people who invented uh, Murder Incorporated, um, really, uh, you know, Meyer Lansky and uh, some of those, some of those guys, right? So she was nominated for two Oscars, actually. The first one was for Midnight Cowboy in 1969. Uh, she lost that Oscar to, uh, uh, to Goldie Hawn, who I, I, that must have been Cactus Flower, I suppose, that year. And she was nominated again in 1975 for a kind of a modern film noir, Farewell, My Lovely. Uh, she lost that, um, that Oscar to uh, Lee Grant. Um, mm. So uh, just died, uh, by the way, uh, Joan Micklin Silver just died last year. It's less than a year since the director passed away last December. And uh, um, uh, Sylvia Miles died in 2019. Um, she, uh, um, was born in 1924, so she would have been, what, 94, 95 years old when she died. Um, here, uh, here's something that says now, you know, God only knows who to believe here, but this says she was born in 32. Yeah, no, she changed her birth date a few times. <laughs> I'm sure she did. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so that's definitely not right. <laughs> um, so. Um, I, interestingly, there, there was a pilot for the TV series, uh, The Dick Van Dyke Show. Uh, uh, the original pilot, which actually had Carl Reiner, who created the show, playing the part that Dick Van Dyke plays in the show. Um, but in that original pilot, uh, Sylvia Miles plays Sally Rogers, 
uh, the, the role that uh, Rose Marie gets. Uh, and probably, although I'm not sure of this, uh, she wasn't able to uh, join the TV cast because she was probably filming Murder Incorporated when the, uh, when the show began. So, um, uh, and I just mentioned uh, Yerun Krabe, uh, you know, uh, perhaps best known to uh, moviegoers in America for uh, uh, his role in The Fugitive. Um, he's, he's been in a lot of movies. Uh, but you may be surprised to know that uh, he is a, a Dutch Jewish descent. Um, so um, his grandfather, Abraham Rees, was actually uh, killed at Sobibor uh, during, uh, during the Holocaust. So um, uh, he's also, uh, besides being a, an actor who's been in numerous things, he, he's well known as a painter as well. And his... Uh, um, his father is also a painter. So, um, and, and there's, uh, I, look at that. Thanks, Vanessa. There's some of his work there. So, um, I first saw him in a movie in 1983. So five years before this, uh, in a, a movie, um, oh gosh, what's, uh, it's called The Fourth Man. I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the director at the moment, but uh, not terribly important, but just that, uh, you know, he was, uh, he got his start there. There's a movie that I'd love to show one of these days called King of the Hill, uh, which was directed by uh, um, Steven Soderbergh, but uh, doesn't seem to be available on any, in any format we can watch it on. Um, where the Fourth Man was directed by Paul, Paul Verhoeven, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah before he comes to America and, and starts directing some American movies. I, I, you know, it's, uh, um, so it's, a, it's an interesting, it's a very American style movie actually, uh, The Fourth Man uh, for a foreign film. Um, King of the Hill directed by Soderbergh, your own Krabby plays a Jewish father in that movie. And, and so, it's, uh, um, so it's interesting. Um, you know, when we talk about this movie, um, Amy Irving's character Izzy is making a choice between uh, this author Anton Moss and uh, the pickle merchant Peter Riegert, but it's not a choice between a, a Jewish marriage and an interfaith marriage, right, or an interfaith relationship. I mean, it might be easy to read it that way, but but I think the movie goes out of its way not to tell us that about uh, um Anton Moss's character, right? So, uh, and the fact that it's played by a Jewish actor, whether you know it or not, is is worth thinking about, right? In terms of that's not the that's not the the uh, tension here, right? To be Jewish or not to be Jewish. So we'll talk about more than just a moment. Just last couple of things about cast members. You probably noticed a couple of people in this movie. Uh, most likely, you noticed David Hyde Pierce. Uh, I have to admit, I had completely forgotten that he was in this movie. We know him best from uh, his role as Niles Crane in, uh, in the TV series Frasier. Also a big Broadway star after, after Frasier, appearing in Spamalot and in uh, um, uh, Curtains on Broadway, um, another Broadway musical. So, um, so he, he's in this movie in a relatively small part uh, working in the bookstore. Um, the soundtrack to this movie, the, the singing, the, the kind of light harmony singing is from a, a recording group called The Roaches, uh, Three Sisters, um, uh, Suzzy, Terry, and Maggie Roach. Um, some of you may know their music. Uh, I was a big fan and have seen them live a few times. Uh, Suzzy Roach actually plays a part in the movie, too. She's one of uh, Izzy's friends. She plays Marilyn Cohen. Um, and uh, probably mention uh, Rosemary Harris, who has really, I think, just one scene as Pauline Swift, the, uh, uh, the poet who, who's having sort of a, a tea at the bookstore. When part, uh, Rosemary Harris is a... a, a you know, nominated for more Tony Awards, I think maybe than any other actress. Uh, she was nominated for nine Tony Awards over the course of her career. Uh, if you know her from the movies, 
or TV, you're m maybe most likely to know her from, there was a movie called Sunshine about a Hungarian Jewish family um, that she, uh, she plays the matriarch in that movie. Uh, in 1978, she was in the, the TV miniseries Holocaust as the matriarch of a, of a Jewish family. I don't think she's, she was Jewish, but I'm not 100% sure. You may also know her from the first Spider-Man trilogy, the one that Tobey Maguire played Spider-Man. So if you're, you're, you know, that vintage that you like those Spider-Man movies, she was the original Aunt May before uh, in the next set, they decided to make Aunt May 50 years younger and uh, cast Marissa Tomei. Um, but so Rosemary Harris may look familiar to you. And, and the last person I'll mention is Claudia Silver, um, she appears in this movie and she'll also appear in the one we uh, um, watch next week, Hester Street. Uh, she is the daughter of the director, uh, Joan Micklin Silver. In this movie, she plays uh, uh, Cecilia. Right? So, um, so, um, so some interesting folks in the movie and uh, it's a kind of a slice of life, right? Of, uh, um, Jewish life on the, in New York City in the 1980s. Um, you know, the, it doesn't feel like there's really an art director at work here. It's just take the cameras out and, um, and you know, point them at various places in New York City, right? You know, so it's, uh, it, it really does feel like um, a, a walk around the Lower East Side when you see, um, um, you know, the, the pickle place is definitely based on Gus's pickles uh, in um, the the lower Lower East Side. Um, they're, they're some of the former employees of Gus now have their own pickle place, the Pickle Man. But so there's now two rival pickle places on the Lower East Side. Um, but Gus's Pickles was the original. So um, um, so we have this. Uh, so what? What are what is the central conflict here, right? I mean, it's it, it's sort of uh, old world and new world, right? The immigrant Jewish community on the Lower East Side and a more gentrified Jewish community on the Upper West Side. It's um, it's about um, uh, you know, art, arts and um, words versus uh, actions. Right. There's some interesting kinds of dichotomy uh, um, here. I will say watching it again that um, I don't have much sympathy for the Amy Irving character. I think, you know, I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about her. But, um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, um, you know, she, she doesn't come across as being uh, the strong character that I sort of remember. I see, Susan, you have your hand up. Uh, you want to say something, Sue? Yeah, about Amy Irving's character. Yeah. Uh, I, too, um, felt, I kind of thought she was kind of a wimp, mm -hmm. <laughs> that she couldn't, and it's funny, uh, her relationship with Bubby, um, I felt like she was so weak uh, in that relationship, uh, not that she shouldn't respect and love her grandmother, but uh, I have a 30 year old granddaughter and all I can tell you is I wanted her to watch that movie so she'd appreciate me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for not yeah. being a Budinsky. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, I, and, you know, she, I think... and Amy Irving just let her get away with it. And I, I found mm -hmm. that in, in a loving, polite way, I felt like she could have put a stop to it. Right, right. And there's certainly, you know, I, I think the character is complicated, right? And, and yes. so I, I, and I guess I appreciated in that sense, you know, when, when the first time I saw it years ago, I mean, I think, uh, and, and I, I talked to Ann about this a little bit too, of course, we probably saw this movie together since it came out in 1988, uh, we were dating at the time. So uh, most likely we saw it together. Um, and, um, you know, uh, our recollections of the character versus uh, how the movie plays are really quite different, which was sort of striking. I mean, our, our recollections were about, uh, um, you know, a, a young Jewish woman who wants to be out on her own and uh, 
uh, not be beholden to the old ways. I mean, you know, uh, uh, she says, it's not the way I live. That's a hundred years ago, right? And mm -hmm. it's like that. But but then on watching it again, it doesn't feel like that at all. I mean, she hasn't really left the world at all and doesn't really seem that independent. And um, there there is this sort of undercurrent through the movie of, of how she's deluding herself, which is not the way we remembered it, which is interesting. I, I um, um, Alice has her head um, um, hand up. In terms of Amy Irving's uh, character, I, I don't think I had ever seen the movie before. So um, I, I knew about it, but it, I had never seen it. So when I, when I was watching it, I was thinking, oh, this is like, it's so, it's, it's um, so stereotypical. And it's just like, really, it, it was, too much for me in terms of like, I felt like it was stereotyping like the matchmaker and the grandmother and even Amy Irving. But then I started, after I watched it and I started thinking about it, I was thinking that was, I felt like it was in Izzy's head, you know, the character in her head. Yeah. She, she was thinking of her own community in very stereotypical ways and thinking, oh, I want to aspire to this, you know, this literature driven and, you know, the arts and everything. But then when it came down to <laughs> what the people were like in, in relationships, it sh she realized that, um, I can't remember his character, Peter, what's, in, what's his name? Um, you know, the guy she ends up with, whatever his name was, that, that he was very deep and he, there was a lot to him that she had overlooked. So I, I almost I was thinking that I almost felt like the director purposefully, you know, kind of overdid some of the stereotypes to make it that, you know, then she has this realization that you you go beyond the stereotypes. You 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 look into what's really inside of a person. Yeah. Yeah, look, she clearly has a stereotype of what what he's like, right? Because he's a pickle man on the on the Lower East Side. He can't possibly, you know, she's she's always surprised by him when he says, oh, yeah, he's I've been to plays, you know, I go to the theater. Right. Or he says something literary and and, you know, uh, and and she she's shocked over and over and over again by him. Right. So which again, I think doesn't speak well to her, you know, independence oh, you know, as, as a character, but, yeah. but it's an interesting uh, plot point, right? So uh, Sandy's got a hand up. I, I love the movie. I saw it when it came out, you know, originally, I guess that was 88. And David and I watched it last night. We just loved it. Thank you for choosing it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, she was a snob and I knew girls just like that. Yeah. When I was in high school and in college, there were girls just like that, that, you know, would talk nice and everything, but they felt they were above dating certain boys, that they were climbers or whatever. But mm -hmm. I, I thought she was real. Everything about it was great. Yeah, I, I think that's a great word, snob, you know? <laughs> Right. Uh, you know, yeah. and it's not the way I remembered the character from having watched the movie in the 80s and definitely the way I felt about her this time. Right. Uh, so um, so I think that's interesting. Right. But but she's also she's an ambivalent character. And I think that that's actually one of the joys of this movie now, as I see it again, is, is that, you know, I I had uh, in my own memory of it, I had, I had uh, forgotten some of the sort of ambiguity of her character, which I, I find kind of delicious now. Again, I see Linda's got a hand up. But. Um, yeah, I I uh, could relate to her in a way because uh, I think you had to take the time frame when you were talking about if she was uh, progressive enough. I mean, in 1988, just living alone away from the family mm -hmm. and sleeping around. I mean, she had this fella that uh, she was sleeping with was unheard of uh, and her girlfriend had a baby and she wasn't married and there was the bris. 
I mean, all of these things were not accepted at all in 1988. I mean, so I was relating to that. And I thought that um, she was really trying very hard uh, to be different. But there's the old saying, you can take the girl out of the neighborhood, but you can't take the neighborhood out of the girl. So um, I think that the whole thing was very predictable, the ending that she was gonna end up with the pickle man. But I found it delightful. Uh, Steve and I, my husband, Steve and I, we were just reminiscing about our bobbies. And when we were looking at the apartment and all of the characters, because we knew people that talked like that and acted like that. So, um, and the kitchen, what did it have in the kitchen? <laughs> I can't remember now. Anesco. Anesco cooker. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know what it was. Maybe some of you know what it was. I never had seen that before, but Steve was saying that's what his grandmother would cook in her for turkey, for turkeys for and briskets and so forth. And I thought that the grandmother with all the food, it was very, very traditional. So that was my uh, perspective of it. Yeah, and, and there's lovely details in that, that regard, you know, things like that. But, um, you know, just great little things like I love the uh, uh, Bubby's self-defense class, right, in New York City in 1988, which, uh, um, you know, I, I lived in New York uh, in 1988. I was ordained that year. So, uh, um, you know, New York was not the sort of cleaned up uh, Times Square that it is now. Uh, back then. And the Lower East Side was a pretty rough place. Um, then, you know, now, now it's becoming more and more gentrified. And, uh, you know, but uh, there's all these details. So like the, the, as you said, the cooker on the thing, which is uh, something among other things that allows uh, Orthodox people to keep food hot over Shabbat, right? You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, some may remember uh, Cholent, Yes. Um, you know, so, something you, you can make cholent in and you just leave it plugged in all, all Shabbat, right? And, um, so, um, you know, and, and just throughout, I think there, there's these uh, sweet little uh, asides, right? I, I'm there, there's, a, there's certainly something about, uh, you know, so that a lot of people were talking about in the late 80s, maybe they're not talking about them quite as often these days, but, uh, you know, the biological clock, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, she's, she's not married, she's living on her own, she's got her own place, but um, there's something missing, right? And, uh, and so there's a scene, I think she's going into her own apartment building, right? And out from the apartment building come a, a, a whole parade of pregnant women. They've clearly had some kind of group uh, that they're coming out from, you know, Lama's class or whatever it might have been, um, you know. So, uh, which at, at one and the same time seemed very New Yorky to me because uh, it's so much, uh, you know, you wouldn't see that here because everybody would drive there, right? They would drive to the thing. They would, you know, you wouldn't see a parade of pregnant women coming out of a building like you do in New York City. So, um, and a lot of other nice, you know, the, there's her birthday celebration at Gray's Papaya. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a slice of New York life at the time, right? Um, um, so, uh, so there's a lot of things like that. And even the bookstore itself, it, it reminds me of the independent bookstores that uh, certainly dotted New York City back in those days. There are a lot less of them today, unfortunately. But, um, but that, that kind of uh, scene uh, seemed very realistic to me. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Gray's papaya famous for, uh, their bad hot dogs actually, you know, so, but, um, uh, and then there are some lovely touches in the dialogue that I, I the, the story of Harry Schiffman and his new hat, right. Uh, which, um, she, the, which he tells her, uh, talk about, uh, you know, he had this Brown cap that he wore forever. And then, it's distraught because he forgot it somewhere. I said, you know, go buy yourself a new hat. He bought himself a gray Stetson and uh, he ends up getting married, right? He says, oh, that's all it took was a new hat. Well, she couldn't see his eyes until then, right? You know, it's, uh, it's some great, you know, I, I think great dialogue, great stories in here. So, 
there are other things that stand out for you guys about it? Mary, yeah, Mary, you need to unmute. Using Rick's computer, so I'm confused by it. <laughs> um, one of the great lines is when it was the soiree tea party or whatever with the, um, and so the writer who she's attracted to, Anton, the, um, he's advised to write in his natural language, which is Dutch. And he goes, no, I'm not, I'm a New Yorker. So that whole thing, he, his whole thing was, I'm assimilated, I'm, I'm a world, and he used foreign language a lot. He used his skills to impress when he was out to dinner with her or whatever. But when he came down to it, he wanted to be a New Yorker. And um, I think that that really points to his weakness that there's, there's, there's sort of a theme of, you know, if you really assimilate and lose who you are, then you're never gonna be great. You can't really, you have to be true to yourself. And that's what she was, I think, searching for in a way as being true to herself. She didn't know who herself was. She was very conflicted. Yes. She loved her grandmother. She loved the Lower East Side, but she also liked the Upper West Side and she liked the hoity-toity intellectual crowd of the writers, even if they weren't great writers. And so I think that, you know, this, I, but that one line, I think so, kind of summed up a lot of the conflict within the movie. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's, um, the, you know, from a Jewish perspective, right? What we're looking at in this film is this question of sort of uh, how much assimilation is too much, right? Uh, and what do you hold on to from past generations and what do you leave behind? And while we might not want to hold on to, you know, the yenta and arranged marriage, and, and, you know, as the movie goes on, we realize it's not exactly an arranged marriage, not in the way, right? I mean, you know, he says, he says, you know, the the matchmaker comes to see me every couple of weeks, and she shows me pictures, and uh, you know, um, you know, I first saw you three and a half years ago, and when she showed me the pictures, I said, Mrs. Mandelbaum, this one I'll meet, right? right. Um, you know, so so he's a little more uh, attuned to where he comes from, but that doesn't mean he he is the Jews of a hundred years ago, right? And and that's what she's got to find out, sort of, right? Is what, what she can reconnect with, what she can hold on to, what gives her life meaning and identity, which is not necessarily a man and a relationship, but a connection to her background that works in the modern world. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and I, I think that's what's really interesting in this movie um, and we'll see similar themes perhaps in, uh, in Hester Street said in a different time period. But, um, you know, what do we hold on to? What do we leave behind? What do we lose when we leave uh, things behind? What, do we, um, what, what can we take from the, the old world into the new, you know? So, right. um, uh, Ross said flipping through the pictures is now the <laughs> Tinder app. I, yeah. I, I don't know about that because Tinder is really, you know, they have one thing in mind there. Maybe J date um, is a little bit more uh, parallel. Susan. Uh, I, I will say that there is a Jewish Tinder now, right? You know that, Vanessa, right? Uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah, no, I didn't know that. No, no, J I'm not surprised. No. Yeah. So, um, so, and, and I've married couples that met on J swipe. So, um, right, J swipe. I knew that. That I knew. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that's what it is. It's you see a picture and you swipe right or left, just right. like Tinder, I guess. Uh, right. Um, is that, I, but, I, 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 uh, yeah. Where Ross is absolutely right is that the the Enta has been replaced by the computer. Yes. Right? Uh, there's not a lot of matchmakers out there. The computer does it, and I've got it's, it's, it's very very common. You know the, that that. Uh, uh, you know, I always ask the couples who's, who I'm officiating at their weddings, well, how did you meet? And uh, it's very common that they met through a computer dating app of one kind or another at this point, uh, not necessarily J-Date. I mean, there, there's a whole bunch. Uh, um, lately, I've been hearing Kettle of Fish. That's one that I didn't know about. And um, what's the other one? Uh, uh, something about coffee. Uh, coffee and bagels, I think it's called. So... Um, so we, we have, uh, you know, at least three quarters of the couples who I marry meet online these days, I would say. 
Um, Susan. Yes, so you kind of said what I was going to say, that the matchmaker no longer exists because we have J-Date and all these other matchups. But the, the, I thought there was some comic relief, though, with the matchmaker and the bubby, uh, mm -hmm. because they just weren't getting it, yeah. <laughs> that, that this just wasn't the way anymore uh, mm -hmm. in modern times. And they just wouldn't give up. And I kind of found that funny. Yeah. I think there was a comic relief to it. Well, I, there's no question that their characters are played for humor. I mean, the, you know, Sylvia Miles sitting at Bubby's table, you know, <laughs> scarfing down all the food in sight, you know, is uh, <laughs> uh, and, and interesting for, a, for an actress who uh, uh, was known for being sexy you know, uh, a little earlier in her career. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a pretty interesting, um, it's a pretty interesting um, character to play. And, and she, you know, she goes for it. She has, she has fun, I think, playing this part. So. So there, there's a couple of other little things, uh, you know, so there is the scene of the bris, the, uh, you know, and that's, I think, I'm not sure if that couple isn't married. I mean, I it's an interfaith marriage for sure, right? The the father is not Jewish of this baby. So he's he's sort of uh, sitting by himself, you know, kind of isolated uh, in that scene. And the mother of the child uh, can't bear to, to be there. Um, it's sort of an interesting, again, there's sort of the, the old world and the new and, uh, and what's, what's going on there. And I think uh, it's... Is it the grandmother they say didn't didn't have the guts to show up? I think right, and that, that's that's an interesting turn of phrase, right? So, um, so the 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 grandmother, the baby, is, is so disapproving of the interfaith marriage, right? That um, even though they're they're conforming to Jewish ritual, there's a rabbi there and all that stuff, but the uh, the grandmother didn't have the guts to show up. Somebody says so. Uh, I think that that's clearly something that a generation later it would be quite different, um, but it but it's sort of an, another interesting snapshot, sort of of the time that the movie is made. I think, right? So, um, I, I yeah, Who is that I name? wasn't sure whether he was Jewish or not, but uh, they're not married. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not clear on, on that either. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure he's not Jewish, but I, I, I don't remember for sure whether, yeah. did they say something specific? Did anyone catch something specific? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, they weren't married. And there's, there's the scene where um, the mother the mother's with the child. She's trying to, she wants her to, to be a, a baby model, right? And she's sitting, you know, and Amy oh, yeah, will take visit. Picture, maybe. But, but she, but she, there's the thing about her doing this alone. So I think that that um, she makes a comment about, the, and, and that the baby yeah. better start bringing in some money. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So I think that was the real. That was sort of you know the aftermath of that. That they you know sort of say, okay, let's get this point clear. They they are not. They were not married, and this woman had had a baby out of wedlock, and she's doing it herself. Yeah, as you well, well know from your family how how much money it takes to uh, raise children yeah. in New York City, right? I, I mean, it, it, you know, it's maybe more. I'm sure it's more now, but maybe not more in real dollars than probably in, not in real know. dollars, but yeah. But but so in '88, uh, I'm you know there. It seems seems like uh, it it seemed very real, right? Yeah, let's see if we can get this baby to bring in a little capital here. You know? <laughs> gotta, every, everybody's got to help. Which, by the way, strikes me as very much like the Lower East Side at the turn of the 20th century when uh, the immigrants came to New York City, and uh, they were, you know, using their their apartments as uh, as factories, right? Um, uh, doing um, you know tailoring work and things like that, and the kid, everybody was involved, you know, every generation. Um, when you visit the Tenement Museum in New York City, you, you hear those stories, right, about how, you know, the kids were carrying the garments from one apartment to another, you know, for the different scene uh, uh, tailors to do their work. Right? So, um, so it, it's only a sort of an update that in 1988, it's now, let's see if we can get this baby to be a model. 
That, I, I think that was pretty typical. When I had my kids, we used to get ads all the time about bring your baby in and get pictures taken and mm -hmm. and see if you can have them model. Right. So that I think it was pretty common to yeah. and and they all had they were all agencies. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they would make money off of you. Right. Right. Yeah. Nice. Well, we've got a few more minutes. Anything else? Uh, did anything else catch your eye? So I, I want to, if, if not, I want to go back to kind of where we started uh, about Joan Micklin Silver. I see Ed waving his hand there. Ed, do you want to unmute and say something? Uh, I really liked uh, the vignette, the insert when our pickle man is waiting for Amy Irving uh, to meet him on the date. And of course she's late, she was tied up with the other guy and what have you. And he's with Bubby and they do that fabulous little Yiddish uh, song and dance uh, uh, vignette. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought that was great. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you know, that pulled her right out of the Yiddish theater and he was right there with her. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and I don't know, maybe it was just me, but I also liked Amy Irving's big head of curly hair. <laughs> it, wasn't fr it wasn't from the beauty shop. It was just the way it was. Yeah. There, there's this, you know, he sends her a hat, right? I mean, after telling yeah, the story. He sends her the sombrero, the lid. <laughs> and says on, and when she walks to the bookstore, David Hyde Pierce gets sort of a, a classic sort of uh, David Hyde Pierce kind of line almost from Frasier. It's a, uh, it's a, the return of Annie Hall. It's, yeah, it's, that's right. Like so. Which, which of course was a good uh, 10 or 11 years before this movie, Annie Hall. So that Annie Hall look that sort of swept, uh, at least swept New York for a little while, you know, uh, uh, you know, gets a good line in about that. But yeah, that scene with, with Bobby near the end and, uh, you know, it, it's, I, I will say it's one of those moments that you're just sort of infuriated with with uh, Amy Irving's character for not showing up on time to that, uh, to that dinner, uh, at least I was, uh, you know, to, to hang out with Anton Moss instead. But, um, but it does give us a, a great chance to see, um, uh, see Razel Bosick uh, do her thing. And um, uh, and he's still there, of course, uh, when she finally does get there. And, uh, you know, I, and he says to her, I know what you're thinking. Uh, Schmuck, what are you still doing here? <laughs> All right. Um, but, but then they have a lovely scene. The, the music in the background is a, is a classic song, too, called Come Softly to Me, but in, sung in a modern tone and tempo by the roaches in the background uh, for that scene. So, um, so I, I think it's, uh, uh, there's a, a lot of lovely things to say about this movie. I'm, and uh, so I'd, I'd go back to where we started that um, not a lot of women directors got a chance to make movies. And, uh, and I think she made the most out of the opportunity. Uh, you have a, a movie that has uh, um, very little uh, sex, violence, profanity, um, you know, it, it's just an interesting uh, slice of 1988, you know, in, in so many ways. So, um, so I, I think we uh, owe a debt of gratitude to her for making this kind of gentle romance. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it doesn't feel like a contrived romantic comedy the way uh, uh, so many do, you know, that, that just have the same formula over and over and over again. Um, it's it's really quite good, I think, in that sense, and and uh, certainly worth being one of our real Jewish classics. Sandy, you've got something else, then? Yeah, so many of the movies today about young couples or young people have the f bomb constantly in the movie. I find it really boring and and distasteful, and I just love this movie. So thanks again for choosing it. Yeah, good. I'm glad. Yeah, and I, I think um, 
Well, that may actually be how people talk. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure <laughs> whether that's the way people talk these days or not. Um, it, it always seems to me to be because you don't uh, know any other adjectives. <laughs> you know, so it's nice. It's, a, it's, it's nice to hear dialogue that uh, is different than that, you know. Um, Rabbi, we're getting towards the end of the hour. I just wanted to give a quick plug for tomorrow night. Um, and the, you have to register and it's easy to register. You just click on the link that I put in the chat. And um, I know that Rabbi, you'll be doing a breakout group, right? Yeah, I, mostly facilitating. It's not a lot of teaching involved, but I'll be facilitating the breakout group with Rabbi Kelman um, tomorrow night. So um so yeah it's, uh, it, as some people were getting on you heard i mean we have 36 different congregations in the chicago area that are signed on to this our guest speakers are coming to us from israel which means that they're going to be staying up or getting up at two or three in the morning so that they can be on with us so so it'd be nice if we had a nice turnout and showed up uh, to, to keep them company uh, also, next week's uh, movie, Hester Street, streaming on Amazon Prime. Uh, not streaming. You're going to have to pay like $1.99, I think. So, um, but that's where to look for it. And um, this Sunday, Roselle Shertuck will be talking to us about um, Elvis Presley and his connection to the Jewish community. So, uh, and just, I'm going to say to this group, thank you. Thank you for being here and for... Uh, uh, coming back. Um, but also, um, you know, I can't claim to have seen all the great Jewish movies. So if you've seen something that we haven't talked about yet, and, you know, you think it might be of interest to others, let me know. Uh, I'm always looking for the next thing, right? So, so please keep me in mind if you've seen something good. All right. Thank you, everybody. If you ever need help with any links or something, please email me. I'm happy to help. Um, great session. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.